You could be wiser as an educated advisor. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator. On today's show, the four cash value policies, part five of our series on cash value life insurance and tax-free income, all here on Let's Get Down to Business. Well, welcome to our fifth segment. We're talking now about prospects and clients. Risk tolerance tests for life insurance. I never thought I'd see the day, but that's what we're doing because we have to make sure that we're matching up the suitability issue. And so in a case that I had recently, we actually did the risk tolerance test for all four for a 162 double bonus. Because of that, I had to make sure that each person was suitable for the risk. So I showed all four, I wrote a program for Innsmark called Life Compare. It compares par whole life, universal life, indexed and variable universal life, all on one chassis. And when I look at that, chassis and I look at that illustration from Innsmark, I'm looking at where does the client fit in suitability. So if I have a client that's very conservative and he doesn't want any risk and he doesn't want to lose any money, I can't use any universal life product at all. So keep in mind that I might have to be par whole life depending upon the client's propensity for risk. So I'm always going to do a risk tolerance test for product suitability. Now the four major chassis, there's participating whole life, there's current assumption universal life, there's index universal life, and there's variable universal life. Depending upon their propensity for risk is how I'm gonna choose the chassis. And in one example, and I think this is a great example, I had a client, those clients that I talked about in the 162, I asked them to do the risk tolerance test and they were extremely conservative. So I went back, I had originally shown index with my agent, and we showed index and everybody else was showing index. Our competitor said that we could not lose money with index, zero was your hero. If he meant that you couldn't lose money on the crediting account, I agree with him. If he says you couldn't lose money at all in an IUL, I disagree. We still have bills to pay. All those expenses I just showed you in the, in the last segment, I still have to pay all those bills. If I have a zero crediting, which I'm glad for, I didn't lose anything, but now I'm gonna have to pay the piper and pay the expense loads of the policy, and that's gonna bring me negative. And keep in mind, in 2001, two, and three, that was negative. Compounded losses in IUL. So just keep in mind, and these people could not stomach any losses, so we wound up doing participating whole life. Remember, suitability is gonna be a big issue here. Risk tolerance, still the same thing. We have to measure this out. And so before you just automatically send out indexing, which I know is hot and really a great product, just remember, you need to do your due diligence on the client and see where they lay out on their risk tolerance test. Now, crediting rates for index universal life. And the only reason I'm gonna harp on this a little bit is because this is the main product line that's out on the street right now that's getting so much attention. The S&P 500's 100% probability gross. You know, when I'm looking at this, they came out, and I'll show you this in a moment, uh, a company, a carrier came out with rates. They used two 20-year tranches month to month. So they had, I think, about 400 and something segments that they looked at, and they did it on an annual point to point, and they said, what's the probability rate for the S&P 500 under these two 20-year tranches? And that average is right around 5.5. Oddly enough, if you're gonna be doing par and you were looking at the probability rate of the S&P, that was pretty close, participating whole life and the S&P at 5.5. Now, that's a probability rate based on those models. Then, the construction of IUL, it was really built for 200 basis points over whatever the carrier's interest rate is. So even though people wanna show eight, 9%, and of course we can't do that anymore with AG49, but people that were showing big numbers, I always said, if they're making 4% on their current interest on their bond uh, section, let's just go ahead and go 200 basis points and show six. I'm trying to see the, the, the product was built for this kind of thinking, and that's where I want it to go. And then remember, the UL gross rate for AG49 is all over the board. I'm, I think the spread right now that I've seen from the most aggressive to the to the to probably the most conservative could be a whole point. So even though AG49 kind of topped us off, especially for the loan arbitration part of that equation, pretty much there's a big wide spread still of about 100 basis point play on total rate of return. So you have to make sure that you're matching up the same numbers the same uh, uh, measurement of when you're taking the money out so that everything's equal so you have a good opportunity to be as objective and as agnostic as you can on what products you're gonna use and even if you're using all IUL. Really, remember, there's only really four or five really great IUL products on the street 
and those guys are great. Depending upon your health, you might want to go to one over the other because they have a lot more benevolent underwriting. But some of them have better indexing products. The index itself is better. And some are just really, really good at the one that's chills in 90, well, 72% of the time, which is the S&P 500. This is just an example of one carrier's details of their AG49. Every carrier has this. They'll list their products at the bottom of the page. They'll tell you their thinking behind it and what their minimum illustration rates are as well, and I mean maximum. And look at these numbers. And even in this one that I'm looking at now, there's quite a swing from 743 all the way down to 6.08. So you'd really need to look at everybody's pages. And there is a software out there that I like called LifeSpecs, which will compare all your index life insurance products. I'm a contributing author for, for them, so I just wanted to declare that. And they have a really good way of modeling and getting in front. This is one of those pages that I like to have. If I'm going to do indexing, I want to see those numbers. And I want you to look at the lost decade. Interestingly enough, we're looking at this period from 2000 to 2010. They call it the lost decade. Four out of the, the 10 years, the S&P 500 lost money. If you were to be really fair, you could actually calculate that there was a difference that under indexing, even though I lost those first three years, I actually still made about 6.3% on average. And the market lost about 2.4% on average. So my spread indifference is pretty large. It's almost 8% spread. But keep in mind, this graph is not showing dividend participation. It's only showing the S&P 500 under an indexing format. And the reason I bring this up is because those years that you see flat that are zero, which I applaud, remember you had to pay policy expenses during those years, and every single contract that I'm aware of lost money during those first three years during that time. And keep in mind, during 2008, the debacle of nine, we lost it again. So four out of those uh, 10 years, the S&P 500 lost. Now there are some other indexing, by the way, where I noticed that the, the historicity of that index lost one out of those 10 years. So that caught my eye, and that's why I bring it up to clients sometimes. Instead of doing the conventional S&P 500, I might look at another index because that index is really quite uh, uh, done quite well and only had one bad year in the S&P 500. If this is designed correctly, it's almost, all, it's almost undefeatable. But if this is not designed correctly, it's almost always indefensible. I cannot tell you time and time again, when I look through enforced ledgers and illustrations of competitors, how this is not designed for the maximum accumulation and maximum distribution. And this is why we have to be so self-policing in our industry, because this is so good, and if it's done correctly, it can be a tremendous thing for the client, especially in retirement and having tax-free income that's not reportable on your Social Security. I think it's great. So keep in mind, if it's designed correctly, it's almost always undefeatable. If it's designed incorrectly, it's almost always indefensible. Well, I hope you enjoyed our series on cash value, life insurance, and tax-free income. And keep in mind, before moving forward with any of the ideas on our show, always check with your tax consultant, legal counsel, or compliance officer. And don't forget to subscribe to my consumer show, Steve Savant's Money, the name of the game. Daily content that you can post on your website, social media accounts, and database distribution. I'm Steve Savant. Thanks for watching.